straight ahead on Law & Crime Daily. Kenosha, Wisconsin braces for a possible decision over charges in a police-involved shooting. The news as a trial date is set for the suspected protest shooter. Issues of bail have uh, remained in full force and effect. Do you understand that, Mr. Rittenhouse? Uh, yes, sir. A pharmacist charged with ruining hundreds of doses of the COVID-19 vaccine, why police say a conspiracy theory might be the motive. And new evidence could delay the trial for the former officers charged in the George Floyd case. Investigators now say they found drugs in Floyd's vehicle, but the search comes months after his death. Step like, out and face away. Okay, if I was a please, don't shoot me. Please, man. Plus, our exclusive scoop on a climber who went through great lengths to take incredible photos. He kept um, catching a break every time we, we thought we were going to get to him. How the nationwide search finally ended with an arrest. Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. The suspected Kenosha shooter has pled not guilty to charges stemming from the fatal protests. Kyle Rittenhouse is accused of killing two people and wounding a third during protests in August. Rittenhouse was released from jail on a $2 million bond. He's now facing seven charges, including two counts of homicide, attempted homicide, endangering safety, and illegally possessing a firearm. Prosecutors most recently added a seventh charge, violating curfew. The local sheriff declared a 7 p.m. curfew on August 24th as people took to the streets outraged over the police shooting of Jacob Blake. Rittenhouse appeared in court remotely from his attorney's office for his arraignment. Your Honor, I would acknowledge receipt of the information, waive the reading of the information. I have went over all the potential penalties with my client. He's aware of them. I've also e-filed um, a jury demand on count six for a six-person jury and the $36 fee um, earlier today. All right, thank you. Uh, I assume then at this point you're going to be entering pleas? Yes, prepared to enter not guilty pleas to all the charges contained therein. All right, thank you very much. Not guilty pleas to all counts contained in the information are noted and entered for the record. Matter shall now be counted for further proceedings before the Honorable Bruce E. Schrader presiding. And uh, any and all previously imposed uh, bond conditions and uh, issues of bail have uh, remained in full force and effect. Do you understand that, Mr. Rittenhouse? Uh, yes, sir. The judge preemptively set a trial date for March 29th, but there will be a pretrial hearing on March 10th to see if it will actually happen. I'm inquiring to the state how much discovery and when it's going to be made available. Um, I don't know if they have any other dates, but I think to be able to try this case in basically five weeks is kind of ridiculous. I understand the court's policy uh, with Brud, uh, Judge Schrader is to give us a jury trial date out of this, but we can take this up with uh, the court on that March 10th judicial pretrial date. As far as the amount of discovery, uh, Attorney Richards, um, I do have uh, a... Um, external hard drive that contains uh, reports and videos uh, that I can get to you. Uh, if you want to shoot me an email or give me a call, we can make arrangements for that in the next day or two. Sounds good. And now Kenosha is bracing for more possible unrest as we learned no officers will be charged in the, Blake, in the Jacob Blake shooting. A Kenosha police officer shot Blake seven times as Blake was getting into an SUV during a domestic dispute. Police say Blake resisted arrest and found a knife in the floor of his vehicle. Blake was hospitalized and paralyzed, but survived. The Kenosha County District Attorney says he spoke to Blake over the decision to decline to file charges against Officer Rustin Chesky. Charges will not be filed against Blake as well. City officials have barricaded the courthouse and the National Guard has been activated. The emergency resolution comes as officials try to avoid a repeat of violence. Terry Austin has more on possible civil action the local government could be facing. Brian, attorneys for two of the August shooting victims let a court know they plan to sue. Investigators say the two men were shot by Rittenhouse during the summer protests in Kenosha. One of the men was killed. The other survived. Attorneys representing their families each filed $10 million claim notices. The notices are typically precursors to lawsuits. The claims accuse the city and county of being negligent in their response to the unrest. Joining us now is criminal defense attorney Mike Korobonics, along with Terry Austin. Terry, how successful do you believe these civil charges against the city and the county could be? 
you know, Brian, I think they could be very successful from a factual standpoint. We know that the police said to Rittenhouse, thank you for helping us. They didn't stop to even question him about why he was carrying a gun or what his age was. And we know later that Rittenhouse walked right by the police and held his hands up and they did not stop him, despite the fact that there were people who were saying, this person just shot two people. And finally, from a legal perspective, Brian, negligence is just not reasonable care. And we can tell from what happened factually that these police officers did not act reasonably. Now, Mike, like I said, we just found out there will be no charges against the officer who shot Jacob Blake. Your initial reaction to that? It's rather surprising it's with everything that we know so far. It, it's very unusual. You know, Brian, it's so hard as criminal defense attorneys when we see these factual patterns we see every day and our clients, we fight so hard for our clients to minimize the exposure and danger, especially when someone without a gun is shot in the back several times. It's a very surprising outcome. But then again, we have to think of this as lawyers and as lawyers, we do not know what evidence was presented to the grand jury at this time for them to, to decide either not to file the charges or bring them before the grand jury or what evidence they have, but it's rather surprising. Yeah, it's shocking. surprising and shocking as, as well. Shocking is definitely what I would use. Uh, Terry, do you want to give a quick bit about your reaction as well? Yeah, I think it's offensive. I think that the DA saying that, you know, this was a domestic violence is not enough. This was seven shots, and that is, you know, charges should be brought. Now to California, where a judge has ordered a civil lawsuit against actor Danny Masterson must go through the Church of Scientology arbitration. Four women are suing the That 70s Show actor and the church, claiming they were sexually assaulted. Masterson is a well-known member of the Church of Scientology. The women also claim they were stalked and intimidated by members of the church. According to Variety magazine, the judge ordered that the civil complaints must be resolved through, quote, religious arbitration due to an existing agreement. Masterson is criminally charged with raping three women in California. He's scheduled to be arraigned on Wednesday. One of the trials for the so-called doomsday cult mom has been delayed. Lori Vallow Daybell will now face a misdemeanor trial in August after her first on felony charges. Vallow's accused of covering up and destroying evidence in connection with the deaths of her two children. Another hearing for her case is scheduled for Wednesday. Vallow and her husband, Chad Daybell, are seeking to, to disqualify the prosecutor. They're both being held in custody, but neither are facing murder charges. Still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, new evidence filed in the George Floyd case, what it means for the trial of the four former officers. And later, an exclusive look into a climber accused of felony trespassing, the viral photos you don't want to miss. The highly anticipated trial in the George Floyd case could be pushed back as new evidence is discovered. According to newly released court documents, investigators searched the car George Floyd was sitting in for a second time and reportedly found drugs containing methamphetamine and fentanyl. The Minneapolis police officer said they found Floyd in May because he allegedly used a counterfeit $20 bill in a shop. He died after the officers kneeled on his neck for more than eight minutes. Step out and face away. Okay, Mr. Officer, please don't shoot me. Please, man. I'm not going to shoot please. you. Step out and face no. away. I'm going to get you out of the eye, man. Please don't shoot me, man. I just lost my mom, man. I'm taking one out. Step out and face away. Step out and face away. Please don't shoot me, Mr. Officer. Please. Don't shoot me, man. Step out and face away. Can you not shoot me, man? I'm not shooting you. Step out and face away. Okay, okay, okay. The second search of Floyd's SUV reportedly turned up white pills, an empty package of goodnight gummies, and packages of opioid addiction medication. The now fire officers are scheduled to go to trial in March, but their defense attorneys are seeking to delay it until this summer. Prosecutors are not objecting. A hearing on the matter is scheduled for Thursday. Terry, call me suspicious, but a second search found all of these drugs and meds? There's definitely going to be a lot of questions about why they weren't found in the first search, right? 
And rightly so, Brian. I mean, they were thinking that there were possible drugs back on May 25th when this all occurred. And now it's seven months later, and they do this second search, and all of a sudden, they found all of these drugs. I'm not saying that, in fact, they weren't there initially, but it does look very suspect. And as a matter of fact, I think an argument can be made and should be made that this evidence should not be admitted at any trial because they failed to show any chain of custody. So I think this is very suspicious. Yeah, the chain of custody argument works, but Mike, the other argument I think as to why we might not hear this in trial is it even relevant as to what drugs may, and medication may or may, may or may not have been in his vehicle at the time he was killed? Like, how does that play into this case? I, I, I have no idea how they're going to get this in as to any relevance. We just heard in the clip that was just played, the reason they pulled him over was not drugs. And obviously, these drugs were not suspicious if it took them seven months to find it. So I don't think it comes into play. I'd be shocked if a judge let that in because it has no relevance to the matter. Yeah, drugs in his system, I can see that being relevant considering a homicide. Drugs in his car, I don't know, especially if the officers don't know it at the time, but we'll see how that plays out. Now to Wisconsin where prosecutors say a former pharmacist has admitted to purposefully destroying vials of the COVID-19 vaccine. Stephen Brandenburg is accused of spoiling 500 doses of the vaccine at a hospital in Grafton. Brandenburg is facing felony charges of criminal damage to property and recklessly endangering safety. Police say he told them that he intentionally tried to ruin the vaccines because they didn't because he didn't believe they were safe. A detective described Brandenburg as an admitted conspiracy theorist. He appeared in court remotely for his initial hearing. An email from the defendant where he gave a statement that he'd removed these vials from refrigeration. He'd done so on two occasions. His intent in doing so was to render them inert because he'd formed this belief that they were unsafe, that the RNA uh, method of creating these um, medications rendered them unsafe. I know that it involved 500 doses. I know that it was approximately 50 vials. I know that some people, or at least I, I learned um, that some people had been injected with this substance. I don't know who, I don't know exactly how many, and I, I submit that those records would um, be forthcoming from Aurora Hospital uh, in some form, uh, depending on whether or not we need to cert, uh, get additional court orders for that. That's all somewhat in play right now. I know that the defendant was arrested because after the police went to his residence, he was pretty cooperative and fully admitted to everything he'd done. He gave them a full confession that he had done exactly this. His intent was to destroy the medication. He did the things that he was accused of. Coming up on Law and Crime Daily, an elusive photographer tries to avoid police detection. What it took to capture these incredible shots and the man behind them next. veteran is in jail in Arizona charged with burglary, but this isn't a typical case about breaking in. The man is accused of breaking into landmarks to take photos. Angela Levy spoke with a detective about how they nabbed this thrill-seeking photographer in a long crime exclusive. Yeah, Brian, this is kind of a crazy case. Remember that movie, Catch Me If You Can? It's kind of like that. Police tracked the man known as Drifter Shoots across the country, and then they finally caught him. There's no dispute. The photos Drifter Shoots posts on social media are interesting, even breathtaking. But police say the way the photographer takes the photos is a crime. He's using types of pry bars, um, lock pick mechanism sets. He's disabling security cameras, motion sensors. He's physically damaging buildings that he's entering and then going to the top of the building um, and then the police are being notified. Cincinnati Police Detective Jeff Ruberg started investigating drifter shoots in November after a security guard spotted a man with a backpack inside this office building, the Great American Tower. Police spent hours in the building with canines trying to find him. He spent eight and a half hours in that building. Um, he eluded the police and escaped on foot. Police say they identified drifter shoots as this man, Isaac Wright. He was discharged from the Army last year and had attended SEER school, which stands for survival, evasion, resistance, and escape. 
Ruberg says Wright's been traveling the country, taking risks when he climbs on bridges and onto the edge of skyscrapers to take photos. We believe he has counter surveillance. We believe he has friends that will be on the ground if he's on a building breaking into a building. This video from New Orleans shows a man who appears to be Wright climbing a landmark. Police tracked Wright using license plate readers starting in Melbourne, Florida, then to New Orleans, Louisiana, where they missed him. Then it was on to Houston, Texas, cities in New Mexico, and finally to Winona, Arizona, where state troopers finally caught up with him on December 17th. He, he kept um, catching a break every time we, we thought we were going to get to him. He was, he was caught, finally. And that was only with the persistence of the Arizona Department of Public Safety and when we come back, we'll show you more of those buildings that led police in Cincinnati to IDing Isaac Wright, plus what other charges he could face and where as Law and Crime Daily continues. telling you about an army veteran who's been traveling the country taking photos from atop landmarks and skyscrapers. Angela Levy has the exclusive on what led him to being identified. You know, Brian, nobody knew who Drifter Shoots was. He was even interviewed by a television station in Michigan, and at that time he was wearing a mask. He was also selling the photographs that he took on his website. But police say they actually identified Wright after he broke into the Great American Tower in Cincinnati last November. They say Isaac Wright was in the building for eight and a half hours, even climbing into the crown on top. Cincinnati police examined his social media accounts and figured out his identity. All of the photos are now evidence. They say he had previously broken into the Great American Ballpark where the Cincinnati Reds play nearby. He scaled a wall. He, he came over in this area over here, made sure the coast was clear. You could see he's got his backpack. Um, and then he actually scales the wall, climbs the wall, and now he's in the stadium by himself in the evening hours. Uh, it was around 7 p.m. He climbs to the tip of a light post. We're not exactly sure. I think it might be this one or this one. He dangles his feet and he takes a picture of the stadium, calls it Angels in the Outfield. Now, Isaac Wright could face even more charges in Cincinnati after the case goes to the grand jury. Right now, he's facing charges of possessing criminal tools and bur burglary for breaking into that office building. And he is also facing a charge for trespassing, that's felony trespassing, in Michigan. Brian? And Jeanette, please say he traveled across the country. Which other cities appear on his social media? Yeah, Brian, there are a lot of photos on his social media, and they are really cool photos, but police say it's all in the way he is taking them. We found some photographs from New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, places in Florida, many cities across the country, even Dallas, Texas. My panel is back with me for a legal analysis on this case. Mike, I'm looking at some of these photos, gorgeous photos, beautiful photos. But isn't it the crime of how he got atop of these buildings, not necessarily taking the photos? So can they really use his social media to prosecute him for all of these cities if they don't know how he got into the buildings? I think it's going to be, it's going to be interesting. I think it's going to be very interesting how they come about the prosecution and what's going to be admissible evidence. It's going to be very difficult. But one thing is, this guy obviously likes getting as high as he can. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, now, Terry, this Catch Me If You Can story ended with a catch. How is he going to have cases? Is he going to have cases all over the country, basically? I know Anjanette named some of the photos from different cities, but right now, Michigan seems to be the only one going after him. Well, I do think other cities will begin to go after him. I mean, his attorney is going to have to see if he can defend him in these various cases which might arise. His name, by the way, Drifter Shoots, is an amazing name for what he's doing. But I think they're going to have to show that he has some sort of, you know, mental illness or some other incapacity because he doesn't really understand that what he's doing is against the law. And if he does understand that, then, in fact, I think they're going to have to do some sort of plea because what he's doing is taking up time and resources of the authorities. And, you know, that's against the law.
Yeah, I definitely think, and this is just me spitballing, I think he appreciates that it's wrong. I think he's just a bit of a thrill seeker, and maybe that's why he, he got caught up in this. Uh, and Jeanette, had Isaac Wright been approached by police before this incident or before being arrested? Yeah, we were actually told that he had been stopped in North Carolina and charged with some type of trespassing count there. And I should mention also that he could be extradited back to Ohio this week, and police also believe that other people are involved. Now, Mike, we're talking about going from major city to major city, which also means state to state. And if he's traveling state to state with the purpose of committing a crime, could he run afoul of federal charges? I think he could, and I think one of the reasons he could is one of the bridges actually is the border between the United States, is my understanding, and Canada. So there's going to be all kinds of different territorial and jurisdictional questions here. It's a very interesting case, especially since one of the things they're concerned about is at these borders, he breached security. But he's trained to do that prior to his becoming a, sh a drifting shooter. Exactly. If he's, if he's crossing over the border, especially depending on where he is on that bridge, that's definitely federal charges. I don't think the Canadians are going to come after him, though. Uh, probably going to stay here in the States altogether. Uh, Terry, for you, people are going to say, hey, he put his own life at risk, but the reckless endangerment could also be from him falling and hitting people underneath him. So that could be a, a potential charge as well, right? Absolutely. He endangered the lives not only of himself, obviously, because what he's doing is very risky, but if he had dropped any equipment or even if he had himself fallen and someone was trying to save him and they got injured, he definitely was being reckless. And I think there are some charges that can be brought against him, state and federal. We'll see how that works out. And Jeanette, Terry, Mike, thanks for joining us. And thank you for joining us here on Law and Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.